by saying in the name there was a poor Bethesda near the great temple in Jerusalem where those afflicted stay nearby the blind and post and and the lay every now and then to the pool came an angel from heaven and blessing it healing power to the water was given are those who have mercy who give to the poor and fast and pray the holy spirit will fill the Hearts, the sun will show their mercy on judgment day. Blessed are those who have mercy from God, they shall obtain mercy on judgment day christ will set them apart may his holy spirit fill all their heart one was healed whoever god thus would receive the then so the sick way by the pool to get in first was each man. A man with illness thirty eight years was seen by Jesus lying there. Jesus asked him if he wanted to be healed. The man said, I have no friends who care. Whenever I try to get in the pool, someone will get in before me. I have no strength to move in fast, no hope for healing that I can. Be blessed are those who have mercy, who give to the poor and fast and pray. The Holy Spirit will fill their hearts, the sun will show them mercy on judgment. Blessed are those who have mercy from God. They shall obtain mercy on judgment day. Christ will set them apart. May His Holy Spirit fill all their hearts. Jesus and get up now and walk, you will have.
spent to carry your bag at once the man was made and did exactly what he said the Jews and so the man who came carrying that which he used to let they told him that it was no lawful to carry his bed on the Sabbath. The man answered the one who healed me, ordered me to do so. Who is this man? They ask him as Jesus lived away. The man did the blessed others who have not been to the poor and poor. The sun who chose the mercy on judgment day. Blessed are those who have mercy from God, they shall obtain mercy on judgment day. Thank Christ will set them apart. May this holy spirit fill that day in the temple. Jesus, let the man as we hold through. Now that you are the sin no more, that nothing may be for The man went back to, to the Jews and said, it was Jesus who made me for persecuting Jesus, the Jews thought, saying the Sabbath commandment we broke. Blessed are those who have mercy, who give to the poor and fast and pray. The Holy Spirit will fill their hearts. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. I thank you, Lord, for bringing us all here today. <clears throat> I thank you for giving us... To I thank you for giving us this house for us to gather in, for us to be able to enjoy these spiritual songs with you. Um, I thank you for giving us each other 
to support each other and to be there for each other. And I ask you, Lord, to bless this church and the people in it. Bless their family and friends. Bless those who came today and who couldn't make it. I ask you, Lord, to take care of everyone going through something and everyone who's satisfied with what they have. Bless them, Lord. And I pray that you keep us strong through the rest of the Lent. It's starting to become very tough and I pray that you carry us um, through it. I ask you to help us lean on each other and be there for each other and guide each other and be a good influence on each other. Amen. Through the intercessions of St. Mary and all the saints, hear us when we all pray together. Thank you. Our Father who art in heaven. Yeah, the Wi Fi should be yes. Wi Fi is on anyway, so I'm gonna my laptop it took two or three tries. I think I need I'll let the other Yeah, my days. Plug it in, bro. Analog. Sit there and like holding the wire like this. But there's a phone for a Yeah, I'm I was actually quite enjoying it. That was nice. This is the presentation, by the way. So don't know if I'm going to. One, I'm trying to make it not too much of that. There you go. Here's a
I say it's wrong in this case. Oh, yeah. I'll put it as okay. part of the application in case. Uh, Yeah. Uh, I think I'm all right. I think I'm okay. You think okay. If, I get, if I get <laughs> if I get crazy, then I'll be like looking for you. <laughs> yeah. This is that's enough. That's enough. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Start and set up the camera. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Bye. I'll see you later. Right. I walked in and felt really warm, so I didn't turn the heat on. I turned the heat on. Man, you're cold. Yeah, most cold. Then my cable is fine, or I can email you. I can email that. Yeah. Is that like a tablet email address? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Do you want to email it? Uh, smam.gg. Okie dokie. You are? Guys, can you come to the front? Can I run move forward? The Hala Shreya. We don't bite. I promise we don't bite. Come, move forward. Move forward. Guys, move forward. Yeah, let everyone move forward. Come on, get up, move forward. Bro, just watch the football game closer to me. Move forward, come on, guys, come on. Why are you man scared? I don't understand. Just move forward, bro. Well, a headache, well, exactly, and you're sat right underneath the speaker. Here, there's no speaker. Come, come, move forward, my brother. Come. Wow, good reading. Okay. Um... So we have a very interesting session for you guys today. Um, for those of you who received the message, it's called Mindfulness and Early Christianity. I have no idea what it's about other than those two words or three words. Um, so I'm not going to yapper and I'm just going to hand you over to find out exactly what's going on.
So JP, over to you. This working, yeah? Yeah. Put it up a bit closer, okay. Is that good? Can you hear me all right? Everyone hear me okay? Like here. High tech. Is that all right? Yeah, you can hear me fine? So Mark's put a lot of trust in me, it seems. Uh, I hope that um, this session resonates with everybody and thanks for joining me today. So um, as Mark said, uh, today's session is going to be about mindfulness. Some of you may have heard that term before. Um, I'm hoping that it's gonna be an engaging uh, workshop more than anything. So I encourage a lot of questions. Um, if you wanna keep them to the end, that's fine as well. But to start with, could I get everyone um, just to stand up? And what I'd like us to do is just to take three deep breaths together, okay? So we're going to do it together in unison. We're going to breathe in through the nose. And when we, we, we breathe in, I want you to breathe in as much as you can, like really expand your lungs, not the shallow breathing that we do day in, day out. And when you breathe out, just out of the mouth, okay? So I'm going to guide us. So we breathe in. Keep going, keep going. Hold it and breathe out. Of the mouth, get rid of all that air, get rid of all the air, and in through the nose, keep going, keep going, hold and out, out as much as you can. Last one, in through the nose, keep going, keep going, keep going, hold it, and out through the mouth. Okay, brilliant. Um, that was just for my benefit, because uh, I'm feeling a little bit nervous. So thank you very much for joining me in that. All part of the cult now, it's good to know. Um, so yeah, you can take a seat again. So um, what I'd like us to do today, uh, to start with, is uh, begin with a prayer. Um, we've said an Our Father together for those who are here earlier. So um, what I will do is I'll segue straight into this um, reflection more than a prayer. So what we've got on the screen, we've got Psalm 46, verse 10. It's a beautiful uh, psalm, by the way. I do recommend that in your own time you go and read, uh, read it. Uh, there's a lot of pertinent themes throughout it. But verse 10 in particular is the one verse I want us to just focus on for now. So again, we're going to go straight into our practice. What I'd like us to do all together is I'd like us to um, just foster some stillness to start with. So bring yourself into the room, start to be present. And then what I'd like you to do is just soften your gaze. So that means you're not looking at anything specifically. You can also close your eyes if you prefer. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the verse. And then what I'd like for you to do is just to reflect on the words of the verse. And then I'll just put a few pointers um, for you whilst we're doing that. So if we all get into that mind frame. So be still and know I am God. We'll just enter a moment of reflection, silent reflection on that verse. Be still and know I am God. If you find that your mind wanders and you start thinking about things, that's fine. Just note them and bring it back to the verse. Try not to judge the thoughts, don't engage with them. Just come back to the verse, be still and know I am God. Okay, and then slowly we'll come back to the room. Open your eyes. 
Okay, so um, just to start with, um, I will do a little introduction um, on the next slide for those that don't know me. Um, my name's JP and uh, I'm really interested in mindfulness. I'm really interested in presence. I'm interested in um, mental health. Um, and we'll talk a little, bit, a little bit about that in the next um, slide, but just, I wanna start to get engagement from all of you. So um, are there any, initial thoughts on what we've just done any feelings any uh any just initial comments about this form of reflection say compared to uh what we were doing earlier when we were praying uh we prayed the our father for example what's the differences that you can think of between what we've done now and the feeling of what we've done now compared to some of the other prayers that we're usually doing being present I swung here. Be, so, being present and really taking it in. Being present and really taking it in. So what were some of the sensations that you felt when we were doing this reflection? What was uh, some of the thoughts? Sleepy, bro. Sleepy, Fully. sleepy. Okay. Fully. Okay, that's good. That's good to know because I think that it might be that we do fall um, into that trap because it is a, a end of a day of work and we're in a very peaceful environment. So yeah, thanks, Kiwi. Any other thoughts? Comments? Yeah, shout out. Oh, there's two microphones. Okay, brilliant. Um, yes, sometimes I think when you say just the same prayer, sometimes you don't take it in because it's almost rehearsed. Uh, so sometimes it's good to reflect and pause. Sometimes we're too busy to to do that. That's a really that's a really great comment. Sometimes it feels rehearsed. I think that that's uh, certainly true for a, um, a lot of the prayers that we say. I think um, when when we were being when we were being still or quiet, my head was just going off. But when we're saying our father, it's focused on saying our father. That's Brilliant. Just me. No, that's very true. And actually, sometimes the uh, rhythm of um, saying a prayer can actually quieten the mind also. There's a, there's a certain stillness that comes with just knowing something routine and repeating it. So that's brilliant. So just going to jump into the next slide. Um, and I'd like to get some more engagement. I want this to be as little about me or from me talking as uh, much as possible. I'd rather. Um, it's more interesting if everyone else contributes. So what is mindfulness? Let's get some ideas. Shout out. What does mindfulness mean to you? Self-reflection? Yeah? Any Anyone want to chance a definition? What is mindfulness? Or you could do a derivative. What's being mindful? Being aware of your surroundings. Okay. Being grounded in the present. Yeah, brilliant. Is there another comment? Being content, great adjective. Being content, being present, awareness grounded. Any other thoughts on this side? Being mindful, mindfulness. What is it when we say, oh, we're being mindful or like um, be mindful about something? Con conscious, yeah, conscientious, yeah. So like being mindful of the environment, for example, that's one way of using the term. What we're going to talk about is um, mindfulness as a form of therapy that is currently being used and promoted um, for a variety of mental health uh, conditions. But what I wanted to do today, because um, my interest in mindfulness has come from uh, a mental health background. So a little bit of introduction. I, I um, have been in the Coptic community for the past few years since meeting my um, wife Maria and we uh, <laughs> shout out shout out to Maria who's helped me in practicing this um, and uh, I've worked in the mental health sector for around 10 years now but prior to that my first experience with mindfulness was rooted in my own eastern Christian background which is uh, the Maronite tradition and there's a lot of similarities between the Coptic Orthodox tradition I felt very at home uh, coming to the Coptic Orthodox Church, because we are rooted in a Near Eastern tradition, which is very rich and full of um, ways of grounding and connecting ourselves to God that has been lost in many ways, unfortunately. And of the past few decades, 
something within the mental health sphere which has been really interesting is that people have started to be become interested in practices that ground you in the present moment and the, the effects that can have on the mind and what's emerged is a secular practice called mindfulness there's mindfulness-based cognitive therapy mindfulness-based stress reduction i'm going to um, look at a couple of those definitions um i um just before we move on as well just to say um the, the real turning point for me because many of us in a way in a way I'm pre preaching to the to the choir I think everyone here has been really well grounded in your background and the way you've been brought up in the church a lot of this is going to feel familiar so usually when I'm speaking to people it will be to people who haven't had exposure to these kinds of practices and we have that uh, richness in our tradition so where there's um, a lot of familiarity that shouldn't be much of a surprise to you my own um, real like moment where I realized that this was something that was a, a lot of value was when I spent some time in Lebanon. Uh, I was living in Syria for a, around about a year in 2011, and it was just before the Arab, Sp uh, Arab Spring kicked off. As you can imagine, from what was a really stable sort of experience, suddenly everything around us degenerated into chaos. And many of my colleagues and, and students that I was with um, fled, went back to the UK because of my Lebanese background and the fact that I actually wanted to learn Arabic, which was the reason why I was out there. I fled in a taxi under the cover of darkness uh, to Beirut. And when I arrived there, I had no idea what I was going to do with the rest of my time. It was cut really short. Long story short, I found myself in a monastery. I was there for three months uh, in a Maronite monastery, working with stu uh, students in uh, an underprivileged um, a school that was designed for people from under um, underprivileged backgrounds. And um, for that period of time, I basically got to learn a lot about the ways that the monks would meditate and pray and their general routines. Um, and that's where I discovered this uh, practice, um, first of all. So moving on to, sorry, skipped a little bit. Moving on to the mental health side again. So these are two definitions about mindfulness. This zoning back to the secular practices of mindfulness, right? So you've got mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is a therapy that's used for um, or recommended by the NHS for people who have experienced depression. And it's a therapy that is not a replacement for medication or for um, counselling or talking therapy, but it's seen as a complementary therapy. And Mark Williams, who's one of the pioneers of this therapy, is quoted here as mindfulness is a method of mental training that involves noticing what is happening in the present moment without judgment. And Mark Williams was influenced by another pioneer called, called John Kabat-Zinn, who founded what was called mindfulness-based stress reduction. So this is a, a practice that emerged around the 70s in the US. John Kabat-Zinn was a professor of medicine at UMass Medical School, and he was influenced by um, a, a different tradition in the East that wasn't founded in Christianity, but he found these practices that rooted people in the present moment through breathing and um, through connection with their body and that kind of, uh, you know, mind-body connection of breathing and um, being present. And very similarly, it's about being aware, being present and not judging what is going on. OK, so let's move on to something a bit more practical. So I've been talking a bit. Um, I'm not going to give you much of an introduction. This is just going to test out your attention. OK, so are we ready for a little exercise. Let's go, let's go. You might do. Oh, where's the sound? Oh, let's try display settings. Oh, is it on the TV? <laughs> Shall I try now? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, technical difficulties. Um, whilst we're waiting, is there any any thoughts, any questions so far?
You were worried I was going to make everyone skip. I mean, we can do that if you want. No, okay. It'll be a good mind-body connection activity, actually. Do you know what? You're not far off. It's something similar to that. It's going to be more than that, though. Shall I try? Say again? You're on the money, yeah. Could I bring it up on YouTube separately, maybe? Uh, it's going to make a big difference because... Is it the sound? Yeah, it's going from... So it's quite a... Yeah. It's Samba, it's not. I think it is, but it's sort of playing. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It is playing. Okay. Just make it come out of the TV. I just make it come out of your laptop. Okay. Okay. Well, no, don't worry about it. Try make it bigger. jumping rope have to do with the brain well the double dutch requires off the okay that's... today we're going to play a game specifically designed to test spatial awareness meet the brain games double dutch team that's fine yeah 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 advert too many meetings yeah. missing the key action items it's time to put your meetings on otter pilot okay let's go what does jumping rope have to do with the brain well, double Dutch requires off the chart spatial awareness. Today, these kids are going to help us test yours. For this game, all you have to do is keep track of the number of times that either of the girls in green jumps. You'll count each time one of them lands a jump, like this. One, two, three, four, five. As you can see, these jumpers are pretty quick on their feet, so you're going to have to pay attention to keep up. When the whistle blows, start counting. Ready? Go. Okay, simple, yeah? Okay. So, 
How many jumps did the green team make? Did you say 38? Okay, listen. So you agreed with 40% of our test audience. <laughs> now, some of you may be on to us, but for those of you who aren't, did you happen to notice anything else going on during the double dutch? Maybe a giant chicken strolling right through the middle of the set and doing a funky chicken dance? Now, some of you may have missed that funky chicken, but many of you probably saw it, and that's okay, because the chicken was just there to distract you too. Here's the real question. What color was the wall behind the double dutch game? Here's a hint. It wasn't the same color at the end as it was when they started jumping. The back wall was changing color the entire time from bright Did anyone get that? bright red. Nearly everyone missed it. But why? It turns out there's far too much information coming in through the eyes at any given moment for the brain to fully process all of it. As a result, the brain has to act like a spotlight, focusing our attention on some parts of the scene, but not others. Now, most of you were probably paying attention to the jumpers. And some of you may have suspected that something strange was going to happen, and so you saw the chicken. But you probably weren't paying attention to the back wall. And what we don't pay attention to, we don't see. And uh, hey, for those of you who managed to catch everything so far, did you notice that we also swapped the rope turners out halfway through? Hey. Uh. I, th I think that wasn't the point, but actually, I think it was 33. That's what I counted, but then... A moment ago, we made... Okay, let's go back. Right, so... Um, let's see if this works again. Right, so... Um, some of the science behind that practice, right? Um, so... We think that we can multitask. In fact, I reckon most of the ladies in here will probably be like, yeah, I can multitask and guys are useless at it. Would that be right? Well, funnily enough, <laughs> funnily enough, none of us can truly multitask. What we do is something called rapid task switching. And what was proven in that video is that it's impossible to actually keep a track of more than two things at once. So maybe that's a bit of a contradiction, but if you're doing two things at once, you can switch between those rapidly, like your brain is switching. It's, it might give you the illusion that you're doing two things at once. You might be able to pat your head, you know, rub your belly or what have you, or play the guitar and listen to someone singing, but that's still task switching. As soon as you throw in a third variable, that really like messes with your brain and messes with your ability to um, do something accurately. So what the science shows is that your efficiency and error rate goes down the more things you're doing. And even when you're doing two things at once, your likelihood of an error is 40% higher than if you're not. So the reason I'm bringing this up is that this is what we do sometimes day to day, or we're, we're stuck in this mode of multitasking. We're encouraged to multitask. It's very rare that we're given one thing to focus on or given the opportunity to. And so, um, as you can imagine, that's something that, you know, um, brings quite a bit of stress if you're not able to do something, you know, with the true accuracy that you want to do it. Um, is there any thoughts on this, by the way? How did people find that exercise? And uh, what do people think about this idea of not being able to, uh, to multitask, but actually that we're a monotasking uh, type of person? I wish, I wish my boss uh, also, yeah, I think all bosses, <laughs> yes. Sorry, do you want to say it again? So when you're working, you're not really meant to like listen to music or have something on in the background because it's you're not actually focusing on your work. Is that what you're saying? That's really interesting. So um, because you're doing two things and you've got the music in the background, if it's music that is uh, speak, you know, is is has got lyrics and it's engaging your brain and you're listening to those lyrics, that's less conducive to you being focused on what you're doing than if you've got say some calm music that's just like I don't know chill hop or like classical music or something. Um, which doesn't have lyrics that's engaging your, your faculties that are focused on uh, words. So it, it can actually be conducive in a way because it could settle you from feeling anxious or, um, you know, in, in you know, um, it's a way of like focusing your attention perhaps, yeah. If it's music, any other questions, any other thoughts?
That's a really interesting way of, yeah, exactly. That's a really interesting way of putting it because you've got that ability to do two things, right? And so if you're working, you might then get distracted with thoughts or procrastinate. So having the music is a way of sort of like stopping that. It's like a plug in a way, so long as it's not music that's then going to distract you in thought about something. So if it's like, like I said, just like non-lyrical music, that's a really useful strategy that a lot of people use. Yeah? Like, um, like when you're dealing with like visual stuff and you're dealing with like stuff that you hear, you can multitask when it comes to that stuff. But if mm. you're doing two tasks that both need like your visual attention, then you can't multitask. Yeah. I think it's possible when it's two different tasks. Yeah, excellent, thanks. So um, bringing it back a little bit to uh, mental health, um, and then we're going to move into, we're going to segue into the, the, the early Christianity element of this, right? So mindfulness has been uh, clinically shown in meta-studies. So that means like thousands and thousands of people and studies above studies that have been amalgamated and researched that these kinds of practices where you ground yourself, you bring yourself into the present moment, like what we did right at the beginning, those three breaths, you might have thought it was a bit quirky, a bit, you know, funny but that activates your parasympathetic nervous system. Has anyone heard of that before? It's, where it's, it's the opposite of your fight and flight. So basically it's your rest and relaxation. By doing controlled breathing, it can bring you into a state of, of calm, right? And also things like repetition. Um, so saying prayers is a way that activates that same system. And this is something that for two millennium, you know, the early church fathers, had the inspiration to uh, recognize in the way that they were praying. And so that's something we're going to look at um, in the next section. But just to close this off, just to give you a bit more of the science, mindfulness as it stands today, the research based stuff, so the cognitive therapy and the stress reduction um, forms of mindfulness, which have the same kind of roots, are shown to, uh, I think I mentioned earlier about uh, depression. It has been clinically shown that the relapse rate of someone who's experienced an episode of depression who goes through an eight week course of mindfulness based cognitive therapy is 50% less likely to relapse. Now that's separate to medication and um, counseling, as I mentioned, but this is something that is being recommended, not just by the NHS, but also the NICE guidelines and various other big bodies. So mindfulness is no longer just something that, you know, you do and you sort of practice a bit of breathing and it's like, you know, a bit, I don't know, hippie or, something like a bit you know woke or something like that it's clinically proven now that this stuff works not just for depression but for reducing stress for reducing anxiety and also for um, certain individuals who um, experience personality disorders and various other forms of mental health um, challenges it can also be shown to help them and the first time that i learned this so going back from the monastery now i'm working in mental health was in a psychiatric intensive care setting where occupational therapists were undertaking sessions of mindfulness with people with severe, uh, severe mental health, um, uh, mental health illness. And this is a setting that um, if any of you have, um, you know, had the experience of is very, very busy, bustling, um, there's a lot of noise. And this was an opportunity to bring stillness in that moment with people who are particularly unwell. So it's being used every single day in hospitals across the country as a method of bringing people into the present moment. Right, let's go to early Christianity now. So early Christianity, I'm talking the first few hundred years. Now, as I mentioned, um, as a Maronite and um, as Copts and many other uh, early Christians have this same heritage. In fact, the Orthodox um, and Catholic divide and various other denominational divides didn't happen for much longer um, down, down the, the timeline. So in these first few hundred years, we were very unified in our understanding and our approach. And so this is something that I think can teach us something. If you go back in history, often it can give you a bit of inspiration of what the root of our faith was. So what does our faith teach us about being still present and mindful? Has anyone got any thoughts? Yes. 
when you are in the moment of stillness that you hear God the loudest. Yeah, brilliant. And what does God, what does God say in those moments, or what's the what's the sensation, or what is it that you experience? Do you think in that kind of Yeah, that's brilliant. I think everyone does have their own experience. You're right. And sometimes the message can be as clear as day. And sometimes it can be uh, just that peace that you need um, in the day. Um, I did have some uh, biblical verses, but I think it comes in later. So we'll come to that because there are a lot of um, references in the Bible to stillness and to being present. Um, and, you know, the psalm that we started off is the cornerstone to this session. And um, that was a really powerful one. So we've got a little bit of a, sorry to make it a bit like school, but this is an exercise of match the definitions. So um, do we want to have just a moment with your partner next to you uh, to go through this? Or do you want to shout out? Have a, have a 30 seconds. Oh, no, Abuna, you're going you're gonna to ace this. Abuna's not allowed to, to answer. <laughs> no, you are, you are. Are we going to go straight in? Do people want a bit of time? <laughs> yeah, be still, be still. <laughs> Catharsis, yeah. stillness. Okay, so <laughs> a few more seconds, or we? Catharsis means purification, no? Like catharsis, like relief. Okay, so oh yeah, sorry, I've got the mic here. I might need it back for another video, but thanks. Okay, so uh, let's see um, what people think. Just to say as well, before, before we get definitions, there's a reason why these are in Greek. And the reason why these are in Greek is, has anyone got any ideas? Who wants to say why we're, why we're in Greek right now? Because you're going to pull out verses. Close. It's that these are words that were present both in biblical texts, but also in uh, writings of early church fathers. And we know that Greek was the... Um, the language of the t of the time, so it's the most accurate, and also because you get more out of Greek than you do out of English. And to not sound like um, the dad from my big fat Greek wedding uh, with the definitions, there is a richness with Greek, um, and it's the essence and the closest to what we've got. Um, other than, of course, Coptic and Syriac and Aramaic and all these other languages that were present in the, in the Near East, but this was the most prevalent written one. So. Mark, you're eager to give us a definition. I think catharsis is stillness, rest, quiet, or silence. Okay, do you know what? I've messed this up a little bit. Could we start from the top? Do you know what nepsis is? Because it's just I've got the uh, animations. Uh, okay. Sorry. What's we can come back to what's in? Uh, Kiwi is the usurp to you. Kiwi. What's nepotism? Uh -huh. I have no idea. I actually don't know. I don't can... know what Nepsis is. Odd guess, I'll go watchfulness. Why not? You're going to go for watchfulness. Yeah, You're going to go for I'll... a guess? You are correct. Yes, mate. Come so on. Nepsis is about wakefulness or watchfulness. It can also translate as awareness. And it's the closest word that we have to mindfulness. So mindfulness, again, with the English, sometimes it can be a bit mis misleading because mindfulness can make you feel like your mind is full. Some people think of it like, oh, full mind. And like, that's the opposite of what it is. It's actually a, a calm mind and a clear mind. So watchfulness, wakefulness, or awareness, okay? Have a think whilst we're going through these of any biblical verses you can think of, because I'd like to share some of those where uh, the word nepsis or wakefulness or watchfulness is present. And so let's go to Hezekiah. Has anyone got any ideas? Hezekiah. Does anyone disagree with Kiwi? I disagree with Kiwi. Who disagrees with uh, Kiwi about stillness? Jesse. Google it. No. <laughs> okay. Purification. Purification. Okay, I was tricking everyone. It is stillness. Well, thank you for being uh, really still. The mic disagrees. So Hezekiah, stillness, rest, quiet, silence. Uh, Numa. Breath. Spirit or breath, well done for all the doctors out there. Big ups. 
So pneuma means spirit, but it can also mean breath. And why do we know this? Even if you didn't know the word pneuma, why do we know this? What happens when, okay, and pneumonia, but in church, what happens when we get baptized? The, when we get baptized, the priest breathes on the person being baptized, right? So this is where the richness of, uh, you know, Greek and also in, um, in Arabic, for example, we have uh, Ruh al-Qudus. And what is Ruh? Ruh means spirit. And it can also mean breath. It can mean uh, wind, right? Uh, catharsis. Purification. Purification. Purification, brilliant. So we have the English term cathartic, which means to get out. And a lot of people um, currently will be engaged in catharsis through fasting, which is a way of purifying and, um, you know, uh, making ourselves more primed for uh, God and spirituality. And so that leaves us with theosis, which is union with God. So connection with God. So what biblical references uh, can you think of that relate to stillness or watchfulness? <laughs> this is a good practice of stillness, okay? We have to allow the sounds to continue and we still got to be present. Who's got any thoughts? <laughs> it's perfect timing. You couldn't make it up. Okay, mic, microphone. Mic, mic, mic. Yeah, it's tight. It. When Jesus used to go away by himself and pray. When Jesus used to go away by himself and pray. Yeah, absolutely. And the 40 days in the desert um, are a good example of that. So um, any other uh, references that come to mind? Um, the verse that says, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have its own worries. Say that again, sorry. The verse that says, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have its own worries. Do not worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow has its own worries, yeah. Any other thoughts? Shall I throw some out there? I've, I've written some down. So what about Matthew 11, 28, 30? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So we're talking about, what word are we talking about? We're talking about stillness, rest. We're talking about Hezekiah, okay? That's the word from before. Stillness, rest, quiet. Um, Mark 4, 39. In the story of Jesus calming the storm, he demonstrates mystery over chaos, commanding stillness. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. What about watchfulness? I remember I was... Um, I think it was during COVID I, I um, attended a session like this and it was led by Father Anthony and it was about, um, it was about um, demons and exorcism. I think there was quite a lot of people that joined that one because uh, I guess it piques people's interest. But um, any thoughts on watchfulness, being awake and aware as it relates to uh, Garden of Gethsemane, well done. So, um, that wasn't the one I was thinking of, but that does relate to Peter and the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus said, you know, could you not stay one hour with me? Could you not watch one hour with me? OK, so it's about falling asleep, not being awake, not being present, being distracted. One Peter five. Oh, sorry, Mark, go on you. Absolutely. And that is, I believe, is that Revelations? Thessalonians? Matthew 26. That's it, exactly, yeah, with the with the lamps. Brilliant. Good, good, um, great suggestion. And um uh, just a couple more. So the one I was talking about was 1 Peter 5, 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So sobriety, it relates, to, uh, being alert, sorry, it relates to uh, nepsis, being awake, right? So what we're talking about when being awake is not, it's not like, you know, having lots of caffeine and being buzzed and being like, you know, it means being present. When you're fully awake, you're, you're, you're here and you're not judging. Remember those definitions earlier about judgment. How often do we look at something or we engage in something and we don't judge it? 
like we're looking at, uh, I don't know, anything like um, you're looking at something on your phone, you're looking at a thing on social media, you're immediately forced to make a judgment. Is this right? Is this wrong? Is this interesting? Is this not? But how often do you actually look at like a tree and just think it's a tree and not make a judgment of like, oh, the tree looks a bit like yellow and maybe it's because of the weather and maybe because of the seasons and oh, look, that branch is broken. It's very rare that actually we let our minds just be present. So this is what we're talking about here is being awake, being present, being alert. So next slide. So remember Hezekiah, right? It's about stillness. It was about calm, restfulness. These are the saints that I found with the name Hezekiah. The name is Hezekias. Has anyone heard of a Saint Hezekias before? Not like Hezekiah, no. I hadn't either. So when I was doing the research for this early Christianity, I looked up saints named Hezekiah because I, I saw that there was like a link between stillness and between early Christianity and the, the practices that we'd engage with. And what I found was that there were four saints called Saint Hezekias, right? And what's interesting about them is that they're all early Christians. You're not going to find the Hezekiah or Hezekias from past the uh, sixth century. So we're talking like, uh, well, seven, sixth, seventh, Saint Hezekias of Sinai. These are all um, saints, by the way, I recommend reading because I was reading them this week and I found them really interesting. And it's uh, such a different form of Christianity to what um, we're exposed to, um, you know, these days, and which is much more cerebral and liturgical and that is also has its place but it's interesting to note that the early christians we're talking the first few hundred years were experiential you know they were based in practicing stillness they were based in ascetic hermetic practices going out into the wilderness you know spending time in um in uh, the caves and being connected to nature and to god so um i won't i won't stay on this slide too long but it was just a point to make that stillness was a common theme hesychasm is another term which comes from hezekiah so it's not hezekias which is the name now i'm really sounding like that guy of um, my big fat greek wedding but hesychasm is an uh, a verb it's the doing action of stillness that this in christianity and it's um particularly popular in um in eastern orthodoxy slightly different from oriental orthodoxy which we're um we're aligned with and this four part five part definition was provided by bishop callistos ware has anyone heard of bishop callistos so he's a very um uh, he was a pioneer in his own right of theology and the practice of these kinds of um uh, grounding prayers and uh bringing you into the present and he defines uh, hesychasm. Um, he passed away two, two years ago, in fact, and he uh, was so impactful on Christian uh, spiritual practices and theology. He broke it down into essentially two parts, um, solitude um, and then union with God, which is theosis, the word theosis, connection, and to get to that connection through the Jesus prayer. Have we heard of the Jesus prayer? Okay, brilliant. And in fact, the prayers before this session, there was a lot of um, speaking of Lord have mercy. Uh, we have Kiri Eleison. Um, and we'll go into the verse where the Jesus prayer comes from most closely. But these are the two main parts, which is about solitude, quiet, and then connection and union with God through the Jesus prayer, which Bishop Callistos Ware refers to as a psychosomatic technique. Sounds like a big word. We're going to practice it together and you're going to understand what that means. OK. Um, part five, I find particularly uh, entertaining, which is the theology of St. Gregory Palmas. Um, that was basically a bit of uh, like early church beef. If you want to look into that, you can you can read about St. Gregory Palmas, um, who defended hesychasm against um, some Western churches that were against hesychasm as a practice. Um, does anyone recognize this monk and priest, Father Lazarus? Um, I might need the microphone again to do that special. Thanks. I'll do the special flex and see if it works.
Father Lazarus. So Father Lazarus is going to talk to us about the Jesus prayer, hopefully. Is that working? Well, the Jesus prayer is now famous in most of Orthodox, many, many Orthodox countries, uh, from the little famous book called The Way of the Pilgrim, in which he, he explains how the Jesus prayer gave him the self-acting prayer of the heart, the warmth of heart, which which connected him to to God, to Christ. And one of the great teachers of our time, Postus Ware, has uh, explained in many of his lectures and many of his uh, his talks how how it's best to to connect the Jesus prayer to to a busy daily life. I would like to add my voice to the voice of Bishop Callistos and uh, continue this uh, this application. Now, the Jesus prayer can of course be said just ad hoc. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. When you're shopping in the supermarket, you can say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, under your breath. You can even think it without saying it word, aloud in words, in, even in a whisper. You can just think it. So the Jesus prayer can be used as a daily uh, memory sign, a mnemonic to remember Jesus. Wherever you are, driving, walking, uh, even, in, even in a crowd, even in a family, when people are chatting and you are sitting there, you can at, from time to time, you can repeat the Jesus prayer in your mind. So without any great spiritual backup, the Jesus prayer can be a connecting link between you and the name of the Lord. Now, this is a good thing, like if you are jogging, if you are running, if you are, if you are swimming, whatever you are doing, to keep the Jesus prayer in the back of your mind. This is a very, very valuable technique. It keeps you all the time aware that you belong to Christ. So walking, if you're if, if you walking from one place to another, driving, people drive many hours each week in their cars and they could pray the Jesus prayer without taking away their concentration. Like a mobile phone takes away your concentration. But Jesus, the Jesus prayer can be used in, in every situation as a mnemonic, as a memory trick to connect you to Christ. So um, beautifully put, Oops. Beautifully put, um, so as Father Lazarus said, it's a way to connect you and to make you aware of the fact that you belong to God. So it's about awareness, it's about connecting with this, uh, this awakenness, right? And it's a method to get you there. Um, would someone, to switch up the voice a bit, uh, be up for reading this um, passage from the Bible? Who's got a voice that they'd like to use? Thank you. Uh, from the beginning, so to some who are confident. Okay, to some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, uh, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up at ev to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man rather than the other went home justified before God, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Thank you so much. Um, so as you can see from, the, um, from this parable, the, the Pharisee is very much in his own head. And he's thinking about himself. He's put his ego there. He's like, I am so great. I don't do any of these things. And, you know, I am, uh, you know, a really great person. And I do, uh, and, you know, I, all of these qualities. But they're very cerebral, very in the mind. And what we have as a counter to that is the tax collector who, as we all know, would have been someone who's looked down on and seen as like, you know, a bit snidey, someone who's, you know, trying to just make some money off of uh, average people comes in and says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. So simple, so clean. And what is being said here is there is a, there is a, a harking to God. There is a, a prayer being said, which is a connection to God. And it's about understanding that there is a level beyond you. It's not about what you do. It's not about you know, all the great things you do, but it's about that connection. Interestingly, what does prayer mean? What does, what does the word prayer mean? Anyone got any thoughts? 
Connection. Excellent, Abuna. It's communication, right? Praying, we communicate with God. And commune, to commune, means to be at one with, to, com to you know, we have communion together. And that means to bring together. So when you pray, you're connecting with God. Which is a better way to connect with God? Is it to stand there and say, oh, look how great I am. Look at all the great things I've done. Or is it to say, God, have mercy on me? And the sinner part in reference can be looked at, you know, from a theological point of view, sinning. Or it can also be looked at as not connecting with God. Sinning is distance from God, right? It's not being close to God. What, what we say hell is, is disconnection from God. So sinning is a way of being separate. So this tax collector had more recognition and wisdom in this parable than a lot of people that are referenced by Jesus, because he recognized my condition is to separate myself from God. How do we do that? It's by thinking, it's by being stuck in the world, it's by looking at your notifications or being worried about some deadline, right? And this is a really simple way to say, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to connect to God. I understand that I'm weak. And so I'm going to ask for God's mercy on me, the person who always gets distracted. That's where the Jesus prayer comes from. So linking this back to our psychosomatic practice, what we're going to do is we're going to do a bit of a competition. I think this um, uh, talk, and I, you know, I'm really grateful for your um, sort of patience and time with me. This is the first time I've done this, and it's uh, gone a bit meandery compared to how I practiced. I've also not been well. I'm not trying to get sympathy here, but um, like my voice has only come back a few days ago, and my uh, loving wife got to listen to this for <laughs> um, a couple of rounds. But I would have liked to have sort of practiced this a bit more. But the idea I hope you're getting here is that there are practices out there today that are now being promoted as like, this is the way to calm your mind, to support you with mental health uh, challenges, and to bring you into the present moment where everybody gets distracted. And yet two millennia ago, we had church fathers who were doing this without any understanding of science. We didn't even know about antibacterial soap. Do you know what I mean? It was very, like, it was very, very old. It was very, very like, you know, primitive kind of way of living by comparison to today where we know everything. We have Google, we have ChatGPT, we have all these things. And so, there's a moment where you recognize the penny drops that we knew this all along. There's nothing new under the sun that actually we had this wisdom imparted and we believe by God and by our um, faith in Jesus who came and showed us how to live our lives. So connecting these together, we're going to practice the orthodox practice of the Jesus prayer. And the way that it is practiced by monks and um, uh, people like Father Lazarus is that the prayer is split into two. It's split into one part, which is Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and the second part, have mercy on me, a sinner. Has anyone heard of the term nav navel gazing before? It's not something that's really used uh, very often. It's a bit, um, did you hear it, Abuna? Yeah, navel gazing is like breathing, it's like meditating, people use it for that. It's interesting because some people see it as a negative, like I'm not a navel gazer, I get things done. But navel gazing actually comes from the Orthodox tradition. It comes from the early church tradition where monks would pray with their head down and they would say a prayer like the Jesus prayer. And on the in breath, they would say, Lord Jesus Christ, son of God. And on the out breath, they would say, have mercy on me, a sinner. And we're going to practice that. And they would be looking at their chest because that would be an anchor for them to stay present where their mind would wander. You're looking down and you're actually seeing your inhale and exhale. So. What I'd like to do, I'm going to make this a little bit um, sort of more high tech just for the sake of when I say high tech, I'm going to play a YouTube video that's got some sound to help us. Um, but just to help us along with how slow you should uh, try practicing this uh, exercise, controlled breathing, like what we did at the beginning, like I said, really easy way to ground yourself and to be present. So it calms your nervous system, calms the mind and it actively reduces thoughts. We have 40,000 thoughts a day, by the way. That's what the latest science shows, 40,000 thoughts. So not all of those are gonna be like, oh, nice jumper, or I don't know, like, you know, oh, I've got that thing to do. A lot of them will just be like, you're looking and getting on with your day, oh, going to the toilet or something. And you just like, you're thinking in your mind about something from the past or the future or which door to go in. 
40,000 thoughts a day. How are you supposed to pray with 40,000 thoughts a day going on? So you need a technique to try and help ground you, to calm you. So controlled breathing combined with prayer is really powerful. And what we're going to do is we're going we're to play this. So can we all commit this to memory, please? I think it's quite easy to do. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, because I'm not going to be able to have this up while I put the video on. And what we're going to do, we're going to practice together inhaling. I won't do it like before, where I was like, I might just use my hands just to give a sense of where you should go with it. But there's a video that will help you. Um, so it's more personal and you're going to get distracted. You're going to get out of flow. And the point of the music or the, the sound, you'll get it when I play it, will be to guide you on the inhale and then exhale. So just remember, inhale is Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. Exhale, have mercy on me, a sinner. OK, we all got it. So let me get this video. There are so many different types and names of breathing exercises. This is not something that you need to think of heart coherence. It's just another name for a controlled breathing exercise. The reason I like this video is just because of the sound and the visual, and it keeps you um, connected. Welcome to Take a Deep Breath. Today's breathing exercise is heart coherence. Oh, it's not going to get me there. Try to open it. Coherence breath work. Well, tap into AI creation tools. Wix. Speed up your site content with a built in copywriter. Welcome to take a deep breath. Today's breathing exercise is. Okay, so what you're going to see is an inhale and an exhale. And all that is is to just keep you guided. I'll be surprised if not a few people fall asleep to this because it's very relaxing. But what I want you to remember is on the inhale, we're saying, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. Exhale is, have mercy on me, a sinner. Okay? So on the inhale, it's about five seconds in. It's quite slow. So if you want, I can model you one. So for the next one, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. Have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the speed at which you're going with this exercise. And you're breathing in consciously as you're saying it to yourself. And you're breathing out consciously as you're saying the second part of the prayer. You can use the visual to start with to get you into the rhythm. And then what I'd recommend is that you close your eyes and you use the sound as a cue and you keep the prayer and you recite it in time with the sound Lord Jesus Christ son of God have mercy on me a sinner Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, mercy on me, a sinner. Just notice as you're saying the prayer and as you're breathing, how the air is entering your nose, if there's any point which you can anchor yourself to whilst you're saying the prayer. Any sensations that you're feeling whilst you're breathing. Might be the feeling of your lungs expanding and detracting as you breathe in and out. If you get distracted, just remember to bring yourself back to the prayer. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. Mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, 
Asana. Keep going for a few more rounds and then we'll come back together. One more. Okay, so if you just open your eyes slowly and bring yourself back. And we have come to the end of our session. So uh, thank you everyone. I hope that was interesting and engaging and um, I really welcome any questions, um, any reflections. Go for it, do you want a mic? <laughs> I, I don't agree with this, but there's a school of thought that says that if you have like a good, strong relationship with God, you won't ever have like mental health challenges or you won't um, like you wouldn't be depressed because obviously you anchor your your faith in God. I don't agree with that, but like, how would you respond? What's your take on it? Please? It's a really interesting one. And I guess the same could be said about any other illness. Um, the thing with depression is that it's not. I think there's a misconstrual that depression is somehow self-inflicted sometimes that, you know, you just got to pick yourself up and get on with it. And that's a lot of the stigma that goes with um, quite a few mental health issues. And what I'd say is that um, when you look at it from a biochemical point of view, there's no real argument that depression is something that you can either, you know, as a result of circumstances in life, um, you know, ne neurologically enter a period of depression it's not something that sort of uh, you either have it or you don't um i think that people go through what we term episodes and those are moments that people can enter depression and they can also um you know you hope with the right therapy and the right support um uh come out the other side um but i would say that there's a difference between being sort of depressed as a like colloquial depressed like oh, i'm feeling down and depression itself which is a clinical um, a clinical uh, mental health illness. I uh, 100% agree with you, Jean-Paul. I think, Mina, I think any of them, most of the mental health challenges, some of them they start, we all go through some of them, all of us, whether it's I feel a, a low at some point or I feel upset or anxious at some point doesn't mean that I'm not connected with God. It's just how long do I stay there? Is that what determines um, whether I am actually like depressed or not? So it's like someone getting a bit of a flu or a cold. Someone can die from a cold, like if someone is elder or has their, their, their immune system very low, they can die from a cold. But most of the people who have a cold or a flu with their current physical immune system fighting back, they will come out of it. So we all go through bad times. Uh, yeah, St. Anthony the Great, who actually helped a lot in the some of the Lord's Prayer formulation. At some point, he was bored from prayer. So God said to him, okay, you have to work and pray, work and pray, and that way you fight boredom. So challenges, whether they're psychological or physical, they are, we all go through them. The, the, the what you're saying, which I agree with, the more I'm connected with God, the more I don't stay there for long, because it helps me uh, to go th to to get into the upside part much quicker. But everyone goes through low moments or low feelings of feeling upset or tired. I don't want to even get out of bed. But the more I, if I, in my mind, if a spiritual person would say, actually, I need to get up to pray at least. So that on its own is a push psychologically as well as spiritual. How can you be upset? How can you be sad? Depression is not really a thing if just love Jesus, love God, which 
you know, there's two sides to that. But yeah, yeah, I think loving Jesus, loving God, will help you to get out of it. It doesn't prevent you from ever being upset or low or having a hard time. There is no prevent. It's like I say, if I have a good immune system, I will never get ill again. Well, actually, no. There's very small viruses who actually will still knock your immune system a little down, but it will never like kill you to some extent. But so we all go through them. A really interesting uh, uh, conversation. I'd say um, I don't agree with a lot of this because a lot of the you know, practices that come from like things like mindfulness or like breathing techniques or like um, awareness comes from a lot of like new age practices and philosophies that you get um, nowadays. And because it comes from new age practices and philosophies, I'd say um, it's not good or beneficial in any way. As obviously God and a lot of the church fathers were against this sort of thing. But, um, you know, so like but what I do agree with is the Lord Jesus Christ prayer and with like someone with mental illness, like um, even the prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ himself, you know, like advised to the disciples and to Christians. I think that is a really good step in uh, whether like, someone wants to heal from um, uh, depression or grief that they have or whatever it is, it's a very useful prayer in the church. Yeah, thank you for that contribution. I think um, just to say as well, I think one of the interesting things that I was uh, exposed to in putting this presentation together was that what we see a lot of is um, promotion of practices that do originate in other religions like Buddhism. Um, and I think Buddhism is probably the most famous um, for these kinds of practices. And so I guess what I was trying to stimulate today is the idea that actually we have our own versions of these. So we don't have to, um, say you know mindfulness is exclusively to one religion or to one uh, secular way that you can find it in christianity in fact this was the essence of um a lot of the christian approaches and i'd really encourage people to look at monastic um practices and to to you know discover for yourself the traditions that we have that we might not talk about all the time um was there a question over there point yeah I was just going to say, um, with regards to your parents, most people's parents, most people's grandparents, it sounds weird to say, but it just didn't have time for depression. Like most people, it's the truth. Like my parents, they were immigrants. I think most people's parents here were immigrants. They had no choice but to work hard. They had kids. Um, some of them probably left more challenging situations in whatever countries they came from. So from their perspective, they didn't have time. They probably felt it. But because they had so much riding on it, riding on them, they just didn't have time to tackle it. So whenever we mention things about depression, about mental health, which we should rightly comment on, which we should rightly tackle, they just can't understand it. It's like a massive generational gap. The world has changed, but certain mentalities may remain the same. Yeah, and I think environmental factors and culture and all these different aspects feed into it for sure. Yeah, the leggy. This is just a reflection. I think it's. It's so it my first point is like it's nice to always see that mental health does not contradict our, our religion or any of that. So I thank you so much for like um walking us through that. Uh, and the second thing, the mindfulness part, I think especially in the lead up to Holy Week, where it's a very intense week in church, um where there's a lot happening and a lot of hymns and stuff, and sometimes your mind can go wandering and just you know it's. Uh, It'll be useful to try and use some of those techniques or the Jesus prayer to keep our mind present in when we are in church because you know long services mm. you know your mind your mind is bound to to wander um and I think it's such a good time to kind of have a talk like this um so we can use it because it's only three weeks away um we'll be in church a lot we're going to be in these services and just the idea of um using the breathing techniques the Jesus prayer um to just stay grounded mm. uh during that time so yeah, yeah thank thanks, you Lagi. and you know there's so many we're so uh blessed with opportunity to find things out you know youtube's brilliant um as google is and you can find out about um people like father like the father lazarus and um other um other monks and the way that they pray and the way that they approach um lent and the way they approach um easter um because obviously we are lay people and we work and we have stresses and we have other 
uh, challenges that we we deal with face to, uh, day to day. But there are benefits also to understanding, um, you know, the monastic tradition and how we can incorporate even for a moment. You know, it's funny that even three minutes of breathing and, and mindfulness, um, again, this is going back to scientific research, is enough to actually change your um, to change your mood. Three minutes. And think about when we, you know, don't pray or I like, haven't got time for it, you know, for whatever reason. Only three minutes. I mean, the Jesus prayer is so short. And it's one of those prayers as well, just a side note, which you would have noted, is that it's designated by Jesus. I mean, Jesus, this is the parable from Jesus, and he was basically saying this is how to pray, just the same way that the Our Father is a prayer that we know that has been designated to us by Jesus. He said this is how you pray. So it's a much shorter version, a, a different prayer for a different purpose, but we have it to our disposal, and it's a really useful um, prayer, I think. Any uh, other questions, comments, reflections? Uh, Baba Shura has a book called Calmness, and it is probably one of the best reads. Wow, I've not heard of that. Really good book, and he everything that you've been saying today is very much in line with what he pushes for. About the Jesus prayer, there's a chapter in that book as well about it. Oh, thanks. It's Abel. brilliant. It really is brilliant. Amazing. Well, if anyone's not heard of that, I've certainly not heard of that, so thanks, Mark. That's really um, helpful. I'll... I'll try and source it. Is there a uh, Amazon, bro? <laughs> oh, and there's PDFs. Amazon Prime. There's, there's I can PDF, see the PDF. Right, okay, yeah. Yeah, nice. Any other thoughts, comments? Is uh, did anyone fall asleep? <laughs> Hopefully not from boredom. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long day for a lot of people, I'm sure. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, and yeah. Uh, one of I'll just uh, share because you, you shared a couple of things a couple of times saying uh, it's nice to read about the monastic life, which when you we are getting trained to be a priest, but most of the big things you get them from the monastic teachings, but you, at the same time you get told actually don't use the monastic life a lot in your teachings because you are talking to laity. So the the breathing and breathing out is one of them but actually one of the other um exercises you can do if you follow the monastic life you know guys the matanya which is the prostration mm. so actually people used to do this with the jesus prayer so when you go down you say my lord jesus christ and when you get up say have mercy upon me the sinner and it reflects the worship because i'm worshiping jesus christ and as you are, you are getting up you're saying raise me up through repentance i am the sinner so so that again but we don't talk about this exercise because the matanias are for the monks and the, and the and the clergy so there are a few of these exercises which are really i find them really loving and they have been there from the fourth century there yeah it's just uh, so i i thank you for actually asking people to read this monastic thing because the depth in these people's uh, lives and what they share with us is absolutely amazing. Thank you, Abuna. I didn't actually know that about the um, uh, the Matanya that, that yeah. was connected to the Jesus prayer. They, I knew the they, prayer rope as well is used, isn't yeah. it? They, they, they do the rosary, they do the, the Jesus prayer. They, yeah. they, the Matanyas are lots of uh, people. Lots, it's one of the... So some people say, if I sit down still, uh, especially if I'm a bit active, uh, it doesn't work with me. So we've push them towards the matanias because you are doing something, you are doing a physical exercise rather than sitting down yeah. and I'm just breathing in because that doesn't work with some of the people who are a bit active. Yeah. So the father said, okay, you've got this and you've got that. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you, Abuna. And I think it is important for us to, you know, promote, um, at least to be interested in this because where there's a gap, especially in society as well, it will be filled. So if we're not filling it with uh, examples that we have from our own tradition, they will be filled by others. So I think it is, it is uh, important to understand and to have that knowledge of our own tradition. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, how do we normally finish? Is it a prayer or Mark? Can we give another round of applause, please? Ah. Yeah, yeah, Yusnina is going to come up in a second. I'm just going to give one announcement. Uh, the retreat on the 27th of April retreat, it's more of a seminar. Guys, please pull out your calendars. 
please put it in your diary, please book, please attend. The point of this seminar is it's not a retreat and I'm specifically using the word seminar because it is a back to basics. It's called Service 101. And what we're going to attempt to do is go to the bare bones of service and learn from you guys, hopefully, what challenges, what difficulties or what stands in your way to serve. Um, we put down the structure today and I think it's going to be amazing. And I know I'm, I'm kind of biased, but I'm being serious. Like it's really, it's not a talking at you kind of thing. It is very much a, please come help us figure out what's going on, but to teach you as well, the bare bones. So if you're a servant, please come. If you are not a servant, please come. It is for you first and foremost. please do attend. It's only a tenner and even the tenner is, won't even cover costs. It is literally just a way of forcing people to come because when they have money on the line, they, they attend. They like to get their money's worth. Um, so please do attend. If you don't have the link to book, please come and find me. I will send it to you. It's going to be very interactive. It is not a sit down and just listen. There will be a couple of talks. There's going to be a couple of workshops. There will be an activity. There will be some food. So we will feed you and we will send you home fed. Please attend. 27th of April, 9.30 is mass. 11.30 we'll have brunch. 12.30 the day will start and hopefully we'll finish by 6. All right? I'm going to pass over to you, Stina, for the rest of the announcements. No, 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 stop, 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 stop. Long story short, if you haven't booked, what are you doing? I've booked, so uh, if if you haven't booked, then you're not like me. Um, <laughs> so the for the announcements this week, um, next week we've got the next episode uh, of the Lives of the Saints, and we've got it on Saint Marina. Um, and we're going to have our host, Mickey. And then on Sunday, we have the usual YAM Bible study that st starts around 12.45. Next Wednesday will be the week for girls sharing. If you are 18 plus, please come. We just vibe, chill, talk, eat, and that's it. Um, we have the Coat Symposium on the 11th of May. Uh, the Christian story at the sanctuary. Um, we still have the liturgies going on throughout the week. There are three Fridays left till Holy Week. So trust me, the five to seven masses, are they just hit different. So try and come to at least one of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, every day. The... The liturgies are every day, but the 5 to 7 p.m. one is on Friday. Um, we are very blessed to have actual food today made by Abu Namina. So please can we go? I think we should all try to follow in his footsteps and serve and feed the congregation. And if you are interested in feeding us, speak to Mina or George. Um, and if you're too nervous to speak to them, go to Dolegi. <laughs> we have the usual food. Like I said, Abuna Mina made it. Please, if you don't like it, then eat it and tell Abuna that you liked it. <laughs> and then we have Tezbah at 10 p.m. Let's pray. Thank you. Thank you. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, God, for everything you're doing for us. We thank you, God, because you've always been there for us. We ask you the blessing upon my brothers and my sisters, and we ask you, God, to instill in us that watchfulness that we can actually empty our brains and our lives so we can just connect with you. And once we reach that level of connection, 
I'm sure we will go back and look at the world and say, why is if all everyone just running around when the true source of happiness and true source of comfort and content is you? And we will probably get busy back again to what we're doing. And we look back and say, yeah, well, that moment was really nice. And we long for it and we go back again and we'll do it again and again until the point that we reach a we reach that we only want to be with you and we find that in you and around you is all happiness and joy. Thank you for Jean Paul. Thank you, Rob, for everyone who managed to come today. People who couldn't make it, Rob, please be with them in their journey. And people who couldn't make it at all and are not, are not able to make it, please, Rob, bless them wherever they are. Accept us into your prayer and conclude for us this beautiful time of Lent uh, so we can enjoy the feast of resurrection together through the intercession of virgin mary archangel michael hear us when we say thankfully and joyfully our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come give us this day our daily bread forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those trespass against us lead us not temptation but deliver us from evil through jesus christ our Lord, the kingdom power the glory forever